Welcome back to a short video. I'm Mr. Welch and we're talking about the Mastara Player's Handbook. I'm just going to keep talking until I get tired of talking about my books. I may be talking for a while. This isn't going to affect the Mad Musings or the Welcome to Mastara. This is just me hyping my product that I'm working on. Giving everybody a sneak peek at what's going to be coming out because there's a lot to talk about. The book is exhaustive in exactly what it can do. And today we are going to be looking at the feats. There's 18 feats that are brand new to this one. Uh, approximately half of them are gladiatorial in nature. You can count the Venator feat as either gladiatorial or just regular. Some of the feats are extremely specific in use. Some of them just add flavor to a character. The non-gladiator feats start with the Battle Chanter, and this was to give uh, originally dwarves a way to get some bardic ability since the dwarves love their history but they don't do arcane magic so they can't be bards. Battle Chanter is a four-part feat. First, you increase your charisma by one up to 20, so which is normal. You gain proficiency in a musical instrument of your choice, usually the dwarves like the drums, though I knew one of them wanted to get a saxophone. You can use a bonus action to uh, give an ally within 30 feet that's having the effects of fear, they can retest their saving throw to end the fear effect. And you can use your action to give all allies within 30 feet advantage on wisdom saving throws until your next turn. And that's a bit of a gamble because if your party doesn't actually have to make a wisdom saving throw in, in your next turn, then you've wasted your action. But you've got the dwarf doing his little drummy thing, telling everybody to calm down and don't freak out, and hopefully you'll be able use that as an advantage. The second feat is Denial, and this is for Hen only. This was a rather difficult one to translate over from the Five Shires book into 5th edition, so I turned it into a feat. This one was included in the book because it gave it a sense of completion. This was a major part of the Five Shires lore. The feat itself lets you cast Counterspell against a wizard as a reaction, but you have to be inside the boundaries of the Five Shires to do it, and you take some small damage when you use it. There's no guarantee of success. The, maybe the Counterspell works, maybe it doesn't. If you're playing in a Five Shires heavy campaign, this might be something you want to look at, but again, I included it because it's a major part of the original setting, and I wanted to bring that into the, the game in 5th edition. The third feat is Extra Attunement. This one's pretty simple. You take this feat, you can attune one additional magic item. Mistara is an extremely magic-heavy setting, especially if you're in Glantry or Alphacia. I mean, the Glantrians have an outside mall which is devoted to just selling magic items. And this feat reflects that perfectly, because if you're a Glantrian wizard or an Alphacian wizard or, say, a dwarf with a lot of dwarven magic items, you will learn how to add more magic items to your uh, character. Street Fighter is a feat that the playtesters loved or hated. There was no in-between on this. This feat gives the D4 weapons that nobody cares about some love. If you attack with a club, a dagger, or a sickle, these all deal D4 damage, and you roll maximum damage, it doubles the damage, so the dagger can do 8 points of damage. If you roll 1, 2, or 3, it has no effect whatsoever. If you critically hit with one of these three weapons, you add an additional D4 for the critical damage. And if you attack a creature with surprise, with a club, dagger, or sickle, you uh, get advantage. We've had some people that wanted to play dagger fighters and thought this was the greatest uh, feat ever. Most everybody else thought this was a really dumb feat. But some people liked it, so I kept it. Keeper of Memories is another Dwarven Bardic feat, though neither of the two, what I call them, Dwarven Bardic feats, are restricted only to Dwarves. Anybody can be it. The Keeper of Memories is you have specialties in Historian, so this raises your intelligence by one, you gain proficiency in the History skill if you didn't have it, and you select one topic to have studied that one, like a, the history of a city, a line of kings, a war, and any tests that require you to remember something about your topic, you've got advantage. So this is kind of like for scribes and stuff. It wasn't play-tested very much, not a lot of people liked it, but a few people thought it, it fit their character perfectly and they used it. And a few times it actually came into effect, especially when we were playing Ravenloft. And yes, we tested a lot of the stuff out on our Ravenloft campaign, because Ravenloft uh, is a catch-all setting and pulls people in from all sorts of settings. So when they wanted to do the all Lupin Ravenloft game, we tried that and everybody had fun. And the Sheepdog Lupin was the Keeper of Memories. Since Mistara has a heavy focus on trading and economics, because I swear one of those game designers was an economics major, I came up with the Master Trader feat. And this one's actually seen a lot of play because it has some additional benefits that are quite useful in play. It's a four-part feat. You get your intelligence or charisma raised by one, 
when you roll on the running a business or selling a magic item uh, chart in your downtime, you roll twice, take the result you want. You can automatically appraise any item within 10% of its actual value. That one was one of the most popular feats in the game because of that, because there's no appraise in 5th edition. We think you're supposed to make an intelligence check, but nobody could find any part in the book where it tells you how to appraise or what to use. If anybody knows that, let me know, because we looked all over and couldn't find it. Maybe we weren't looking in the right books, but the t the index in the back for most of the D&D books is w worse than useless. Oh, and the fourth ability is deception checks against you have disadvantage because you're used, you're used to sorting out people's lies when you're talking about profit. Non-Gladiator feat number seven is Strongman. And this one was kind of for fluff, but it, a lot of people fell in love with it because it gives the big burly fighters something to uh, crow about. Again, a four-part feat. First one, raises strength by one. You knew that was coming. You, it changes Intimidate, Acrobatics, and Performance into Strength Skills, as you are a circus performer. You can one-hand a two-handed weapon, though it does give you disadvantage in all attacks with it. And you are treated as one size larger when calculating encumbrance. If you use the alternate encumbrance rules, you increase the multiplier to 10 and 15, respectively. Very colorful, very flavorful. The combat bonus of the one wielding a great axe one-handed was so inaccurate that it rarely got used, but the rest of the stuff proved out to be very popular. The eighth feat is a quasi-gladiator feat, uh, the Venator, which is Latin for hunter or Venatori, or the Bestiarius as well. And this one is for people who want to fight wild ra rabbit animals in arenas. And this one has three abilities. If you reduce a beast to zero hit points with your melee attack, you, you can take a bonus attack that you can use it to attack another beast. Again, this is only useful against beasts, but it's designed to be fought in a controlled environment. You can use a reaction when a beast attacks you to give it disadvantage for the attack. And once per round, you can add your proficiency bonus to a damage roll against a beast. So if you're fighting lions and tigers and bears, oh my, it's great. If you're not, it's really just a colorful feat that uh, doesn't do anything outside of, you know, the arena. Or unless you're in Raven, will often like to fight a lot of wolves. So I mentioned the gladiator feats. There's eight of them, each one tied to a different Thaitian gladiators. I have studied Roman gladiators somewhat extensively. I own a gladiator helmet and some gladiator weapons. I picked them up in Rome when I was on vacation. I think I got interested back when I was eight and my father took me to the cockpit of this airplane and the pilot asked if I like movies about gladiators. It turned out I did. Each gladiator school is actually tied to one of the nations that Thyatis has conquered or fought in the past. I copied the ancient Rome style of taking conquered nations and turning their fighting styles into gladiatorial schools. Each of the gladiator schools has a different helmet, which reflects what style they are. This again is from ancient Rome, because if you wanted to tell the difference between a Hoplomachus or a Thracian at 100 yards from looking across the arena, that's why they wore those big helmets, so you could tell which one was which. That and the helmets are heavy as hell. The one I have weighs about 15 pounds and you can't wear it for more than about 10 minutes before your neck starts screaming at you. You also can't breathe in them worth a damn, which was uh, intentional because you are fighting to the death. Well, not always, actually. You rarely fought to the death. But regardless, it, they wanted the guys to fight quickly, so they had to hurry and fight quickly or else they would pass out or start to, you know, lose consciousness because they were overheating or hyperventilating. To reflect this, the uh, Gladiator Schools has the rules that if you were put into a Gladiator match, that you have to be wearing the armor that you're supposed to be wearing and they have to strap the helmet to you. Every 10 rounds that you're fighting in gladiatorial combat, you have to make a DC 10 constitution saving throw where you gain a level of fatigue as you start to run low on oxygen or the weight of the helmet starts to get to you. Enough with the history lesson, let's actually get to the schools themselves. The first school is the Corvus School. This is from the fighting style of the Barbarians of the Hinterlands. This is the one with the raven head mask. It has three abilities. It fights with a great club. If you're going to be issued armor in the arena, it will be studded leather. You increase your strength score by one. You can attack with this advantage to make your opponent make a strength saving throw with a formula that was as mentioned above. If they fail the strength saving throw, they become prone. If you attack somebody and they have a shield and you miss by only one or two points, they take 1d4 uh, bludgeoning damage plus your strength bonus as you're designed to break shields. And the fourth ability, and I think they all have four abilities with each feat, if you have multiple attacks around, you can sacrifice additional attacks to gain advantage on your attack and add your strength bonus again for each attack you have sacrificed that turn. So if you sacrifice two additional attacks, you get advantage and you add your strength bonus twice to the attack. 
Flavus is from Ochilea. It is the Oriental style. They are the ones that have the weird Oni demon looking mask. They fight with a large two handed flail called a Kasari, which I just kind of converted over to 5th edition. Uh, the Ochileans don't like this fighting style because it forces them to fight in ring mail because ring mail sucks. The Kasari is treated as a two handed flail with the reach property. You're not going to get a gladiator weapon that has a damage die over eight. Uh, book, which is intentional. The Thiatians want these fights to go on so they don't give people very good weapons. So Flavus gives you a strength score increase of plus one. You can make a trip attack by attacking with disadvantage. If they fail their saving throw, they get knocked prone. Attacks against you with a net have disadvantage, and your attacks against prone opponents deal maximum damage. This one is usually uh, paired off against the Gimmon style because they have a net, which is a historical thing because the Roman uh, gladiator schools were normally only al allowed to fight with other specific gladiator schools. In Thyatis, you can break from tradition, so if you wanted a Flavus to fight a Corvus, which they don't normally do, you can do that, but you're going to have to pay a fine in-game of some gold. The Gimmon is the Pearl Islander uh, fighting style, and yes, this is the Rediarius from Rome, just reskinned. They can get leather armor if they're allowed to have it in the arena. To actually use these fighting schools, you can only be fighting without armor or with the armor that you're trained in. They don't train you with any other armor in this fighting style. So if you wanted to put on plate mail and grab some gladiator weapons, you couldn't get the abilities of the school because you're not trained in the fighting style with that armor. So Gimmon gets a net and a trident. They fight with leather armor, like I mentioned. Their dexterity score goes up by one. The damage of the trident is increased to a 1d8 one-handed. You can use your net as a melee weapon, and if you hit with the net, you can use your bonus action to attack with the trident, and you get advantage. So it's a pretty solid gladiator style. The next gladiator school is the Heranama. This is the Yalari gladiator style. This one is actually heavily armored because it gives you a chain shirt. And you get two scimitars, which you have to fight with both of them. The chain shirt is actually a misnomer. It's actually coin mail from second edition, but I, they don't have coin mail, so I just called it a chain shirt with the, uh, ch the links actually being made out of coins. Tomato, tomato. So the four abilities to use this one is dexterity score goes up by one. If you have two scimitars, they are treated as the light weapon. When you have two scimitars, the offhand one is treated as a shield, so plus two AC. If you attack with your offhand scimitar and you critically hit, you immediately deal damage with the regular uh, scimitar as well. And if your opponent miss, uh, misses you as a reaction, you can move five feet times your dexterity bonus. So lots of moving, dancing around, and hitting people with scimitars. Iurnus is the fighting style that comes from the Isle of Dawn, and it is the Irish fighting style. It's also one of the only fighting styles that gives you options on how to, you can arm yourself. You get a hand axe, then you can get a shield or another hand axe. The downside is, is the Iurnus gladiators don't get any armor at all, ever. It's just a loincloth and a helmet for you, buddy. As you can expect, this is the lightest of the gladiator schools. Your four abilities are increase your dexterity score by one, you gain five feet uh, to your movement, and you test for fatigue every 15 rounds instead of every 10 as you're, well, not so encumbered. And when you use the disengage action, you can use a bonus action you can use only to dodge. So you get to run away a lot. You have to stay light on your feet to fight as an Iurnus, and you will need to, but if you run around too long, the Emperor tends to have a bad habit of throwing that thumbs down when it comes time to decide who lives and who dies. The Legio is the fighting style based on Thiatian military units, and it's an extremely popular style because they're playing to the home team. And this one is the best armored of all of them, even the fact that they get a super shield called a Scutum which gives plus three AC instead of just plus two. And if everybody wants to run out and grab a Scutum uh, for this one, in uh, the Thiatian Gladiator thing, it's a massive steel shield that weighs 20 pounds. It was deliberately designed to be impractical outside of the arena. It's a massive shield, you can hide behind it, but they expect you to lug it around the arena at the same time. You're also armed with splint mail and a long sword, so you're already heavily kitted out with your armor. And the Thiatians don't train you in how to use these weapons or how to use this armor. So if you're a thief and you get stuck as a, uh, in the gladiator school and they make you a legio, you don't know how to use a shield. You don't know how to use splint mail. They're still going to stick you in it and throw you in the arena. Some gladiators are good for killing. Some gladiators are good for dying. Thyatis needs both. Fortunately, your first ability is to increase your strength score by plus one. You gain proficiency with the scutum, which is actually kind of nice. 
You can use your reaction to force an attack against you made with a melee weapon welded with two hands to be made with disadvantage. So you can basically shove the, the uh, shield in the, uh, the, your opponent's face so they can't swing their weapon properly. And your critical range using the long sword is increased to 19. This gladiator school is better than the others from what they're armed with and what they're uh, armored with. And that's intentional because it's not supposed to be fair. These are the these are the golden childs of the Thaetians. It's supposed to make their legions look good. So they get the gladiators uh, better stuff. And the other gladiators resent them for it. Like many of you already know, the Empire of Thaetis and the Empire of Alphacia hate each other. And they really just get into it on occasion. And not too long ago in the game, the Alphacians invaded Thaetis in what was called the Spike Invasion. Emperor Thincall defeated the Alphacians, drove them off. Well, him being a gladiator, he decided to mock the Alphacians by making their wizards fight in the arena using broken staves, which gave birth to the Magos Gladiator, which no armor, and they are armed with two wooden clubs, which are, well, they're maces. They do iron shod them. But this is the one where they just throw them out to, you know, be, be the bad guys. And they usually die, and they're not considered to be a very good gladiator school. And again, that's intentional. They want to make the Alphacians look bad, so they make their fighting uh, school really suck. Those are the guys in the helmets with the weird wizard-looking guy. And their four abilities is their strength score goes up by one. They treat the mace as a light weapon when you wield two of them. If you hit your enemy with both maces on your turn, they take an additional damage equal to your strength bonus. So you could add your strength bonus another time. If you score a critical hit against an opponent, they have to succeed on a constitution saving throw or become stunned for one round. So you just got to keep hitting them until you knock the, the wind out of them. And the last of the gladiator schools is the Milanex, and this is the one that came over from the Millennium Empire, where the Thaetians originally came all those years ago. This one is heavily armored. They look like hoplites. That's what the art, if you, if you saw the art at the beginning, that's the hoplite gladiator with the spear, the breastplate, the shield. This is the oldest gladiator school, but people love it because it's very flavorful, very colorful, and the gladiators look awesome in it. There are four abilities as their constitution goes up by one. You can use your bonus action to attack with the shield. It does 1d4 uh, bludgeoning damage. When you attack with your spear, it gains the reach trait. I should change that to property. And when you wield your shield, you can use your reaction to change a critical hit against you to a normal hit, which keeps you alive a little bit once you get critical hit twice in a round, in which case you're screwed. If you like the movie 300, you want to play a Milix Gladiator. And those are the feats. They're divided between the stuff that you would normally take and the stuff that's pretty much just for uh, Thaetian Gladiators. Well, some of the feats are there to copy abilities from the original Mastara set. The Gladiator stuff was because the module Arena of Thyatis and later Legions of Thyatis had to deal with a lot of the Gladiators, but they didn't do it well. That's something I wanted to address in 5th edition, was fighting with Gladiator styles, because it was a major part of Thyatis, so that almost every town had its own Gladiator arena. My one disappointment with the Dawn of the Emperor's box set is that should have box set should have been all about Thyatis or all about Alphacia, and then the other Empire gets its own box set because there was just so much to write about, and they just cut it down next to nothing. They cheated themselves out of more material for that box set. And I've been talking for about 20 minutes since past my bedtime. I didn't think it was going to take this long to talk about 16 Gladiator schools, but wanted to give the history and the background of it all because this was a fun part of the book to uh, play test and there's still so much left on this book to look at i think next time i will do one of the longer sections well it's long because i have to explain everything but the different types of special magic that mastara has forgotten realms might have wild magic that you can't really control well mastara has radiance magic where you it's super magic that you can enhance there's also the secret crafts of Glantry where they have discovered new forms of magic that is extremely dangerous to use because you don't know how to use it yet. And you've also got the Northern Runic Magic, uh, which is magical tattoos given to them by the Immortals, which might kill them, might give them extra abilities. And playtesting the runes was fantastic because it was a base breaker. Half of the players thought it was broken and unfair that somebody who risked his character dying got all these super special abilities. 
And then you had the one guy that couldn't get enough of these runes that uh, tattooed on his body because they gave him all these extra abilities and he didn't notice that every time you get a rune, your constitution goes down permanently. On top of that, you've got to make death saving throws with no help from anyone whatsoever. But I'll get to that next time because all three of those magic sources use a different mechanic. The schools of magic are like a prestige class where the radiance magic are just super spells that you can find. And then the runic magic is more like a ritual that you have to survive. And then you're still not guaranteed to get the rune you want. So until next time, have you ever been in a Turkish prison?